Hello, and welcome to PowerPointers, Tips and Tricks to Create Effective Presentations. My name is Jesse Trushensky. I'm an Associate Professor with the Center for Fisheries, Aquaculture, and Aquatic Sciences at Southern Illinois University, and I've seen far too many unengaging, ineffective, and just plain bad presentations. In this presentation, I'm going to highlight some of the tips and tricks I've learned to help make your next presentation your best one to date. I'm not a communications expert, and I'm still learning new things about giving presentations too, but over the years I've collected quite a few pointers that are worth sharing. So let's get started and learn a bit about presenting effectively. An effective presentation is one that educates the audience and leaves them with a lasting understanding of the content presented. In a very short period of time, you have to appeal to a broad range of learning styles and engage the audience in multiple ways to effectively deliver and reinforce your message. There are several learning styles that are recognized in the educational sciences, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and read and write. Visual learners intake information primarily through different spatial arrangements and color coding, flow charts and timelines, graphs, pictures, and lecturers who use gestures or picturesque language. Auditory learners intake information primarily by listening to lectures, discussion, explaining the information to others, and remembering interesting examples or anecdotes. Kinesthetic learners intake information by using and doing, particularly if multiple senses are engaged. They also learn from examples and illustrations, lecturers who use real-world examples and case studies, applications, exhibits or examples, and trial and error. Read and write learners intake information in the form of lists, headings, glossaries and definitions, and lecturers who use words well and provide lots of detail. Most people do not fall purely into any one category, and often learning and memory are increased if you have multiple senses engaged during the learning process. For example, even if you are primarily a visual learner, you're more likely to remember information if you both see and hear it, even more so if you see it, hear it, and write it down. A really effective presentation will engage multiple senses and help the audience to achieve a sort of synesthesia, a state when multiple senses function together. Now technically, synesthesia is a condition in which colors have smells or tastes, numbers or words have colors associated with them, etc. But I think it's an interesting concept to consider when you're trying to educate an audience. If you can deliver the same message visually, audibly, even subconsciously, you can create a sort of synesthetic experience for the audience. That is a memorable presentation and an effective one. Let's start by discussing visual aids and how to prepare effective slides. Slides are simply one type of visual aid. They are not the sum total of a good presentation. They are there to help you express yourself, illustrate concepts, and leave your audience with a lasting impression. Slides can help you structure a talk and stick to a timeline, and they also provide you with reminders or prompts during the presentation. But this is not their primary function. They are simply visual aids. Consequently, your primary focus in preparing them should be clarity. If the visual aids aren't easy to visualize and don't aid the discussion, they're nothing more than a distraction. Your secondary focus should be aesthetics. As you'll see in this presentation, there are multiple ways to present information clearly, but some leave a more lasting, professional impression than others. In a technical presentation, visual aids are often used to present our data. Here again, there are multiple ways to do this. Depending upon how you choose to present your results, you can really leverage all those hard-earned data points and deliver a powerful message. Or you can misrepresent your data entirely. We'll discuss examples of both in this presentation. In preparing your slides, it's important to remember that more is not always more. This is true of individual slides as well as a presentation as a whole. Slides that are cluttered, have too much going on, or have sacrificed readability to cram in as much content as possible aren't helpful as visual aids. Similarly, if you have too many slides, you'll spend more time transitioning from one slide to the next than you do on communicating with the audience. The right number of slides varies from person to person and also depends on the kind of presentation you're giving, but a good rule of thumb is one slide per minute. Again, remember that slides are just one part of an effective presentation. Poorly prepared slides certainly won't help, but even the most carefully prepared and powerful visual aids won't save a poorly delivered presentation. Maybe you've attended a lecture given by an instructor who's just filling in and witnessed them stumbling through slides that were hastily handed off to them. Or maybe you've prepared slides for a colleague and then cringed as they mangled your intended message. If so, you know very well that good slides are not the same thing as a good talk. As previously indicated, slides that are clean and simple are much more effective in getting your message across. Remember, clarity is your first priority. 
making your presentation pop with visual appeal is secondary, so we'll focus on that later. There are a couple of rules that can be helpful to consider when preparing your slides, the 5 by 5 rule and the 10 20 30 rule. The 5 by 5 rule states that you should never have more than five words per line and no more than five lines per slide. Now obviously I'm breaking that rule on this very slide. Most lines have more than five words. But in part, that's because this presentation is going to be made available online. Since most people will be viewing this presentation without benefit of a presenter, it's important that the lines include relatively complete information. Also, since most people will be viewing it on their own and at their own pace, we don't have to worry about moving on before they've had an opportunity to read the content fully. The 10-20-30 rule suggests that for a 20-minute presentation, you should have approximately 10 slides and use no smaller than a 30-point font throughout. This is something of a deviation from the one slide per minute guideline, but that depends on the individual and the kind of presentation being given. Regarding font size, the title on this slide is 44 point and the rest of the text is 30 point. This will depend on the font style that you're using. As we'll see on the next slide, not all 30 point fonts are the same size. Remember too that this isn't a hard and fast rule, but for most fonts and context, 30 point font is a good guideline. Using pictures, clip art, animations, and the like can be a great way to get your point across in a way that is visually striking and memorable. This is, after all, why you're using visual aids in the first place. But remember to do so sparingly. Too many pictures, animations, and specialty fonts diminishes their individual impact. Look at the third bullet here. Would it come across the same to you as the reader if the entire line was bold instead of just the last word? Probably not. What if it was flashing or bright red? Well, you would definitely notice it, but then you probably wouldn't pay any attention to the rest of the bullets. Think of this kind of content and formatting as seasoning for your presentation. A little salt makes good food better, but a lot of salt ruins the dish. Not only can too much content give your audience sensory overload, it can also put you in a position where you cram so much onto a slide that the audience can't really see any of it. Don't put yourself into a position to say, I know you can't really see this, but... If the information you're cramming in is truly essential, break it up over multiple slides. If the information isn't essential, get rid of it. Most presenters and presentations are helped, not hurt, by a bit of editorial trimming. Remember that punctuation is optional for presentations. In most cases, you're not going to be using complete sentences, so periods at the end of each line are not needed. In my opinion, end line punctuation makes the slide look less polished, so I usually avoid it. Choice of font is extremely important. Not only is the size of the text important, so is the overall appearance of the font. Remember that fonts vary considerably in their size and readability. Each of the lines on this slide is 30 point. The first example is difficult to read, especially at a distance. Avoid cursive fonts altogether. The same can be said of the Elizabethan style fonts. Most people can't read this easily when it's right in front of them, much less at a distance. The third font isn't terribly easy to read either but it also conveys a message that you might not want to in the context of a professional presentation. It's cutesy and implies that your presentation is, at best, casual or, at worst, childish and amateur. The fourth line is Times New Roman font. Although this is a commonly used font and it's a preferred font for manuscripts and other documents, it's not a good choice for presentations. The problem is that it's a serif font. Serifs are the little ears or structural elements at the ends of the typeface lines. There's an example illustrating serif versus sans serif fonts in the next slide. Serif fonts are often blurry when projected, and they should be avoided. The bottom three lines are all size 30 Arial font. It's a sans serif font and is clear to read, but remember that fonts can vary considerably in terms of their character spacing. The first of the Arial lines is Arial Narrow, and it's much more compact and not as easy to read. Also, keep underlining, italics, bold, and other specialty fonts to a minimum. These modifications can be a good way to highlight key elements on a slide, but if they're overused, they lose their impact and can lead to eye fatigue. Here is a direct comparison of a sans serif font, shown in the top line, and a serif font, shown in the middle line. The serifs themselves are highlighted in red on the bottom line. As you can see, even though the fonts are otherwise identical, the top line projects much better and will be clearer to an audience, especially at a smaller size. Once you've decided on a font, choosing a color scheme is the next important choice you need to make. This may seem like simple aesthetic preference, and to a certain extent it is. You can create a good color scheme based on just about any base color you happen to like. 
but it's important to recognize that not all colors play nice together and that colors can convey different messages to the audience, depending on which ones you choose. Colors are generally defined as warm toned or cool toned, as illustrated on this color wheel. Yellows, oranges, reds, and purples are generally considered warm, whereas greens, blues, and indigos are considered cool. Although some may find associating colors with temperatures a bit strange, it's really quite intuitive. Think of a water faucet. There's no question that you'd associate blue with the cold tap and red with the hot tap. One interesting attribute of warm and cool colors is that opposites tend to attract and please the eye. For example, combinations like yellow and indigo, blue and orange, or green and purple tend to be very complementary. This doesn't mean that other combinations can't be effective, but they may not be as clear green text can get lost on a blue background, for example, or they may clash rather than complement each other. For example, orange and purple aren't considered an attractive pairing to most people. Generally speaking, combining warm and cool colors on a slide makes for easy to read and visually appealing slides. However, there's a right and a wrong way to do this. Usually, it's best to use a cool tone background with warm tone text. Note the difference in legibility and appeal between the panels on the left and on the right. These are the exact same color pairs, but their appearance is very different depending on which color is the background and which is the text. When choosing color schemes, clarity is essential, but it's also important to avoid colors that are boring, have undesirable connotations, or aren't easy on the eyes. A white background with black text is certainly legible and may seem like a safe choice. But white backgrounds are difficult to look at. They strain viewers' eyes and they may be difficult to see depending on the lighting of the room. They're also pretty boring. As background colors, red and yellow are also difficult to look at, and red is generally associated with anger, emergencies, etc. Not a good thing to imply with your presentation. Blue, green, and other cool tone colors are calming, and they don't put as much strain on the eye. In comparing these four panels, the eye is drawn to the blue background because it's easy on the eyes, literally and figuratively. All of these background colors are okay in terms of eye strain, but they have other, more nuanced problems. The top two panels are okay, but they're not terribly engaging. Also, white text can appear blurry on a black background, and like black text on a white background, this scheme doesn't always translate well, depending on lighting. Colors like red and green can be difficult to see on dark backgrounds, and the combination should also be avoided to prevent confusion for those viewers with red-green color blindness. Blue and yellow is a popular combination, especially in fisheries, probably because of the association between the color blue and water. And this is for good reason. This combination hits all the marks when it comes to choosing a color scheme. My personal opinion is that it's rather boring. Again, next time you're at a fisheries conference, count how many royal blue canary yellow talks you see. But it's safe, and you're not going to wow anyone with this combination, but you're not going to hurt anyone's eyes either. To help guide you in choosing the base of your color scheme, consider the following emotions or attributes that are typically associated with these colors. Blue is considered trustworthy, dependable, and like other cool toned colors, it's calming. Green is also considered to be soothing and peaceful, and it's also associated with ecological concepts. It also happens to be the most popular favorite color. However, depending upon the specific green that's used, it can also have institutional or authoritarian implications. Yellow is a stimulating color, and it also encourages communication, but most consider it good in small doses. Like yellow, orange is stimulating and encouraging, but it can also be polarizing. Most people have a strong opinion about orange. Either they love it or they hate it. Again, it's probably best in small doses. Red draws attention, of course. This is why stop signs are red, to grab your attention. But as shown on the previous slide, it can be problematic as the primary color in a color scheme. Purple is considered uplifting and encourages creativity, and it's also commonly associated with royalty or mysticism. Because of its connection to the ground and the earth, brown is associated with stability and reliability, as well as wholesomeness. White, of course, is associated with purity and cleanliness, as well as an ordered approach. However, white can also be quite stark and difficult in terms of projection and slide clarity. Gray is considered timeless and practical, though some consider gray to be unsettling or associated with gloom and doom. It's the least common favorite color, but because of its relative neutrality, it can be a good base for a color scheme. Black is considered authoritative and powerful, and deep dark colors in general are often associated with sleek, powerful presentations. 
However, too dark can mean a plain and difficult to visualize presentation. In addition to the more abstract concepts or feelings that we commonly associate with colors, you should also consider whether elements in your presentation might be intuitively associated with certain colors. For example, this figure is illustrating the hypothetical growth of fish-fed diets containing fish meal or corn gluten meal as the protein sources. At first glance, which one of the treatments did you assume was corn? Probably not the blue line, since corn is yellow and Manhattan are bluish. Your audience would spend a lot less time interpreting the figure legend and fighting their intuition if the colors of these two lines were switched. Once you have a color scheme in place, if you want to wow your audience, there are some simple things you can do to make your presentation pop. Compare the top two panels. Which one draws your eye? The right panel has a simple gradient in the background and really makes a difference. It's a simple change, but it gives the presentation a much more professional look. Adding a picture to the background can be a great way to add interest to a presentation and up your wow factor, but beware of pictures that obliterate your message. Although we're talking about ways to improve the style of your presentation, the substance is the most important thing. The fish picture is great, but it makes it very difficult to read the text and the mixed colors mean that you're unlikely to find one color that's easy to read everywhere on the slide. Adding a shade box, as I've done in the panel on the right, makes the text clearly legible and puts the picture where it belongs in the background. In addition to font choice and color schemes, smart use of animation can add an additional layer of professionalism to a presentation. However, poor use of animation can turn your talk into an amateurish gong show. Over the next few slides, we'll go over some different animation options to see what does and does not work for slide transitions and animations within a slide. Slide transitions are just that the animations that control what appears on the screen when you go from one slide to the next. Subtle slide transitions can be very effective, but as we'll see, few of the many options available within PowerPoint fit this bill. There are lots of different ways that animation can be used within a slide, but the most common type is probably animated text that appears, disappears, or otherwise draws attention to itself. Occasionally this can be a useful option, but more often than not it's a distraction. So far, I've been using a subtle slide transition option called Fade Through Black. This means that when I go from one slide to the next, it's not harsh transition because the first content slide is allowed to fade through a completely black slide, which then fades into the next content slide. This fading process occurs very quickly, and so your eye doesn't perceive it as slide one, black, slide two, but rather as a seamless, smooth transition. I've been using Fade Through Black so far, so to show you what it looks like without this animation, the next slide transition will be a direct transition. No fading, no blending, just one slide to the next. We'll start with one dummy slide, showing some mock content, and then directly transition to a second dummy slide. Again, this is a fairly subtle difference, so you may need to go back and forth between the slides in the slideshow in order to see it. So this is dummy slide number one, and this is dummy slide number two. Did you see the difference? It's a much more abrupt means of transitioning than you've been seeing in this presentation so far. Now let's go back to the fade through black option so that you can see how much easier it is on your eyes when we transition through the next two dummy slides. So here's dummy slide number one again. And here's dummy slide number two. Again, I was using fade through black here, but fade smoothly is another good option for subtle, effective slide transitioning. Basically, this is the same transition as fade through black, minus the black slide, so the slides simply fade into each other. We discussed two different options for effective, subtle slide transitions, fade through black and fade smoothly. PowerPoint gives you dozens of other options. Why not use those? Over the next few transitions, you'll see why you shouldn't use these ugly, distracting, and time-consuming So here's dummy slide number one again. And here's dummy slide number two, using a clockwise wheel transition. Here's dummy slide number three, using a dissolve transition. And here's dummy slide number four, using something like a newsflash transition. As you can see, these last few transitions are very distracting and disruptive, and they add nothing to your presentation besides an amateurish, look what I can do, element, and lag time between the slides. So remember, subtle transitions can polish a presentation, but you're better off using nothing, in other words, direct transitions, than these quote-unquote flashy transition animations. 
The same goes for animated text. If you have a particular point that you want to emphasize, or text you don't want the audience to see until you've made a particular point, animated text can be useful. However, in most cases, having every line animated is distracting and annoying for the speaker and the audience and takes up valuable time during a presentation. So don't do it. Some people are fond of using animation to highlight items in a list to make it clear that this is what they're talking about at that moment or will be talking about next. This is really common for outline slides, wherein the presenter lists a series of topics to be covered during a presentation and then animates the first item, using a different color or by dimming or removing the other items in the list, to show that that's what they'll be discussing first. Then, when they're ready to move on to the second topic, they'll show the list again, but this time with the second item animated. Personally, I find outline slides to be unnecessary, but this kind of animation is especially unnecessary and a waste of time. Unless you've structured your talk very poorly, of course you're going to talk about the first topic first. Along these same lines, if you need to provide your audience with reminders of what you're talking about while you're talking about it, you probably need to come up with a better plan for your presentation. So it's not to say that you should never animate text or other elements within a slide, but remember to use these animations sparingly and only when they really add something substantive to the presentation. Okay, so you've made smart choices with respect to the visual clarity and appeal of your presentation. The next thing that you should pay special attention to is the proper presentation of your data. Obviously, presenting data clearly is central to a good presentation. That's why you're giving the talk in the first place. But here again, how you choose to present your data isn't just about aesthetics or how easy it is to visualize one line or data point versus another. There are many different kinds of figures that can be used in a presentation, but just because you can plug your numbers in doesn't mean that it's an appropriate way to show your results. In some cases, poor figure choice means that the data aren't presented as clearly as they could be. In other cases, it can lead to figures that misrepresent your data, mislead the audience, and create implications or interpretations that are simply incorrect. Tables are a common means of reporting data, and they are a very concise way to present lots of numbers all at once. The problem with tables is that it can be too dense for a presentation. Tables are great for manuscripts or other documents that people can review at their leisure. All the information is there, and they can pour through it all they like. But unless the presentation is going to be printed or otherwise made available for subsequent review, complex tables should be avoided. If you do include a table, consider the following conventions. First, independent x-type variables are typically shown in rows, and dependent y-type variables are typically shown in columns. This doesn't mean that you can't do the reverse, but this kind of arrangement is the most common, and if you follow it, you'll spend less time trying to orient your audience to the table. Second, use formatting options to your benefit. By using different colors, shading, or fonts, you can draw the eye to the most important information and help your audience avoid getting bogged down in the details. Here is an example of a poorly designed table for a presentation. This table shows the formulation and composition of four different diets. There are a number of problems here. First of all, the text is all quite small, and the outlines used throughout make it difficult to read the table as a whole. Also, there are no clues as to what the audience is supposed to be focusing on. All of the values in the table are the same for each diet, except for the fish oil and soybean oil content. If this information was highlighted in some fashion, the audience wouldn't have to visually sift through all the rest of it to find this out. Now here is the exact same table with some formatting changes. First off, the table is much easier to read. Although the font size is the same, the numbers appear easier to read because they don't have to compete with all those white outlines around each cell in the table. By using different colors, I've highlighted the four different diets and I've also given the audience a subconscious clue to their composition. People typically associate fish with the color blue. Note that the diet containing the most fish oil is the darkest blue color, and as the fish oil is increasingly replaced by soybean oil, the color associated with the diets gets increasingly lighter. Most importantly, I've highlighted the two key differences in independent variables, fish oil and soybean oil in a different color, so the eye is drawn there first. Although this is still a very dense table, by formatting it properly, I can help the audience cut to the quick and see what's most important in a glance. There are lots of different figure types that can be used to present data, including line graphs, scatter plots, bar or column graphs, stacked bar or column graphs, pie charts, radial diagrams, and flow charts. As I said before, not all of these options work well for all types of data. 
In some cases, they may be outright inappropriate. Over the next few slides, we'll discuss each of these figure types and provide some examples of what works and what doesn't. Line graphs are used to emphasize trends or relationships between variables. In this case, I'm using a simple line graph to illustrate differences in the diurnal cycle of dissolved oxygen content in two separate ponds. Line graphs are a natural fit for data that vary over time and can be especially good for showing two or more independent responses to the same dependent variable. Although line graphs can get messy if you have too many lines you're trying to show on a single set of axes, for a few sets of data points they can be quite effective. In this case, you can see I'm using two colors from opposite ends of the color wheel, which make the lines complementary but readily distinguish from one another. However, line graphs aren't always appropriate. Consider this example, comparing a standard line graph on the left with an XY scatter plot on the right. These are the exact same data, but they look very different and imply a different response of tissues to increasing selenium in the environment. The reason the figures look so different is the spacing along the x-axis. Whereas the xy scatter plot correctly spaces the x-values along the axis at the appropriate intervals, the line graph spaces them all equally. Essentially, the line graph considers the values of 0, 10, and 50 as categories with no relationship to one another, not increasing values of a continuous variable. The line graph places x-values of 0 and 10 the same distance apart as 10 and 50, and the result is a misrepresentation of the data and a misleading figure. Even if the x values are categories or discrete variables, that doesn't necessarily mean that a line graph is a good choice. In this example, I'm showing a line graph on the left when a column graph on the right is a more appropriate choice. Line graphs are to be used when there is an expectation that there is a relationship between one data point and the next. In this case, with the use of a line graph, we are implying that gill nets yield a CPUE of approximately 9.5, otter trawls yield about 0.5, and something intermediate between these two gear types should yield a CPUE of 5. Which begs the question, what kind of gear is halfway between a gill net and an otter trawl? Of course this doesn't make any sense, and neither does a line graph for these data. A simple column graph is the most appropriate way to present data such as these. Here is another example of when line graphs should really be replaced with an XY scatter plot. These are the same data sets, but you can see that the dots are connected in the line graph. Does this kind of connect the dots approach really tell the reader anything or provide predictive value? No. These data really call for the use of an XY scatter plot, which allows trend lines to be fitted to the data. This highlights the positive relationship we are really trying to illustrate, and also provides the equation and an estimate of how well the data are predicted by the line. We've already seen a couple of examples of scatter plots as superior alternatives to line graphs. Scatter plots are similar to line graphs, of course, but they are intended to show relationships between continuous variables. Although line graphs can be appropriate for certain types of continuous data, like time, as long as the x values are equally spaced, an xy scatter plot is usually a more appropriate choice. Here are two figures illustrating the relationship of two sets of continuous variables carcass lipid content and fish length and carcass protein content and length. As you can see, we have fitted each data set with a linear regression and have provided some additional statistics about these models of the data. It's important to recognize that there are really two elements of these figures. The p-value, which tells you whether the slope of the line is significantly different from zero, and the r-squared value, which tells you how much of the variability in the data is predicted by the line. So although both of these relationships are significant, neither explains more than half of the variability in the data. So when you present data with p-values and r-squared values like this, it's okay to tell the audience that the relationship is statistically significant, but in terms of biological relevance, it's important to note that the x variable is still a relatively weak predictor of the y variable. For discrete data, bar or column graphs are usually the best choice. The only difference between these two figure types is their orientation. Whereas column graphs like this one show the independent variables along the horizontal axis, bar graphs show them along the vertical axis. Since the bar arrangement contradicts the typical XY arrangement of other figures, they are often avoided in favor of the more common column graph. Although column graphs are quite simple to construct, there are some very simple formatting options that can make a good graph go bad. First, the use of 3D effects. There are very, very few circumstances in which using a 3D perspective improves the clarity and appearance of your figure. 
The figure on the left shows the values cleanly and clearly. It's very easy to estimate the values by comparing them to the vertical axis. However, the 3D rotation of the figure on the right makes it more difficult to compare values effectively. These are the same data, but the 3D rotation makes the data look different, and in this case, less clear. As a general rule of thumb, the gee whiz things that PowerPoint lets you do to a column graph don't make you or your figures look smarter. That goes for 3D rotations and pictures or shapes inside the columns themselves. Another common pitfall for bar graphs is improper axis setup. Believe it or not, these two figures are illustrating the exact same data. It's hard to believe until you look at the y-axis. The figure on the left is showing a complete axis from 0 to 200, whereas the figure on the right is showing a truncated axis from 180 to 200. Zooming in on the data makes the differences look very dramatic, when in actuality they are quite minor. This is a very common mistake that people make when they're trying to make their data look important. It's misleading and in general should be avoided. Stacked bar and column graphs are similar to the standard bar and column graphs, except that they show the whole as a sum of the parts. In this case, we're looking at the overall composition of a fish, total protein, ash, and lipid content, raised at different water temperatures. These kinds of figures are useful when you need to show how different components literally stack up. In this case, we're showing a standard stacked column graph, where the natural sum of the values is shown. You can see these add up to about 90 to 95 percent of the body, since we're not accounting for carbohydrates. I chose this option so that I could highlight this missing piece of information. However, depending on the circumstances, a 100 percent stacked column graph can also be appropriate, wherein the values are all standardized to 100 percent to show the percent contribution. Again, these kinds of figures don't have to be used for percentage type data. Stacked bar graphs can be a good way to show the number and taxonomic groupings of invertebrates found at different sites, for example, and other kinds of discrete data. Pie charts are similar to stacked bar and column graphs in that they also show the whole as the sum of the parts. They can also show parts within parts, as we can see here in these figures showing total carcass composition and the composition of the dry matter fraction. Pie charts are readily understood and they make a great visual impact in a presentation. However, they are more difficult to read quantitatively than a column graph, and it can be difficult to actually estimate numbers based on the size of the wedges. So for pie charts, it helps if numeric labels are included to make sure that your audience interprets the information correctly. There are a number of different things you can do with pie charts in PowerPoint. You can explode them, which means to separate the pieces, rotate them in 3D, etc. But as I noted for the column graphs, these modifications typically do little more than obscure your data. These two pie charts are the same, except that the one on the right has been exploded and rotated. As a result, it's virtually impossible to interpret the data properly. Although you can still see that the one to two times per year accounts for approximately half of the responses, it's very difficult to tell whether, whether there is a difference between the never and one to two times per month categories. Also, the one to two times per week wedge looks a lot smaller than 10%. As with many of the other formatting options available in PowerPoint, it's often best to simply opt out. Flowcharts are another option, and they are especially good for describing processes in a step-by-step -step manner, or as they occur through time. In this case, I'm depicting a sampling routine for a study in which fish were sedated using an electroanesthesia system, and then sampled at set time points afterwards to determine the effects on blood chemistry. Although I could talk about this sampling routine, this is a great example of how a picture can say a thousand words. It's much easier for the audience to follow a complex routine like this when they've got what is essentially a roadmap to follow. The most important point, however, is that this is just another visual aid. You can't flash this kind of figure on the screen and expect your audience to understand it all at a glance. You must walk the audience through the schematic, describing what is occurring at each step. PowerPoint does have a range of flowchart options available under the Smart Art menu. However, you may find that many of these options are too restrictive, and that you'll need to create your own schematics from scratch using the shapes and clip art options. The preceding figure was relatively complex, but this one puts the other to shame, at least in terms of density, complexity, and total unreadability. This is the flowchart that was developed and used by many House Republicans in 2009 to describe the House Democrats' health care plan. It is a shiny example of cluttered, clustered, do-loop rigmarole. And that's what many think this figure was designed to do, to make the plan look as imposing and impenetrable as possible. Leaving the politics aside, let's focus on what's wrong with this flowchart. 
First off, there are way, way too many things going on here. If you're trying to bring together this many elements into a single presentation, much less in a single slide, perhaps you need to rethink and retool your talk. Second, there are lots of different colors, fonts, shapes, and sizes used in this figure, and they don't seem to correspond to much of anything. A good flowchart will use similar colors, shapes, and the like to group similar elements. For example, positive feedback loops could be shown in green, signaling positivity, whereas negative feedback loops might be shown in red or black to signal negativity. Whether you want your audience to or not, they will make subconscious associations between similar shapes, symbols, and colors in a flowchart. So make sure that you are working with this rather than against it. Now that we've seen many of the do's and don'ts of preparing your slides, let's talk a little bit about giving the presentation and how to do so with confidence. The most important thing is to know your audience and to design your talk to reach them at their level. Some of you may have heard of the elevator pitch exercise, which entails developing a one to two minute description of what you do for a living or a project you'd like to promote, and is designed to be delivered in the amount of time you might spend riding in an elevator with a prospective collaborator or client, your new boss, etc. To add to the challenge, imagine different people getting on the elevator with you, such as a superior, a colleague, your parent, an elementary school student, etc. Obviously, your elevator pitch wouldn't be the same for each of these individuals. It can be helpful to go through the same exercise when planning to give a presentation. Think about who's going to be in the audience and tailor your talk accordingly. Also, try to avoid formal structuring, like outline slides, in your presentation. Every presentation should tell a story and should have a recognizable beginning, middle, and end. Well-structured and delivered presentations don't need overt signals to tell the audience where you're at. When giving your presentation, think about your presentation as a conversation you're having with the audience, not a sermon that you're reading to them. One can safely assume that everyone in the audience has a good grasp of the written word. If you're not providing the audience with anything beyond what they could get from a printout of your slides, you're not giving an effective presentation or giving anyone a reason to come and hear you speak again. You would never turn your back on someone in the middle of a conversation, so don't turn your back to the audience. Not only is it a bit rude, it can also make it very hard for the audience to hear what you're saying. Depending on the configuration of the room, the projector, and the screen, you may need to occasionally glance back at the screen to make sure that you're pointing at the right thing with your laser pointer, for example. Glancing back occasionally is okay and understandable, but make sure it's only occasional. Also, if you're using a microphone, be aware that turning to and from the screen can make your voice louder or softer, especially if the mic is pinned to your lapel. Don't play laser tag while you're giving your presentation. Although I'm a human being talking directly to you, you're probably finding it hard to listen to my voice and pay attention to me instead of the red dot chasing all over the slide. This is what I mean by laser tag. The laser pointer can be a great tool, but remember it's supposed to serve the same function as a traditional pointer. You wouldn't continually whack the screen with a wooden dowel during your presentation. Don't do the equivalent with the laser pointer. Also, don't point to every word in the bullet when you're saying it. As I said before, the audience can read just fine, and they don't need you to use the laser pointer like a bouncing ball to help get them, get them through your presentation like it's a sing-along. Know the time limits for your presentation and abide by them. Not only is it bad form to have a talk go over or under time, many consider it disrespectful. We'll have some tips to avoid this on the next slide. And of course, practice, practice, practice. There's no such thing as becoming too practiced. Take the time to practice by yourself, with others, and if possible, in the place where you're going to be giving the talk, or another similar venue. Many presenters are thrown off by the mere presence of a live audience or an unfamiliar setting. The right kind of practice can help you avoid these pitfalls. As I said before, staying on time is critical. Although you can plan each slide to take more or less a minute to get through, you must practice to see whether this is really accurate for you and your slides. More often than not, people find themselves running long on time, so here are some tips to streamline your presentation if it's running a bit over the allotted time. First, present only the most pertinent information. If people want to hear the whole story in full detail, they'll contact you later or read your article on the topic. Second, don't present every data point ever generated. If you can summarize the data, do it, especially if you have multiple data sets that illustrate the same pattern. Try grouping seasons or years together grouping them by similar species, include temperature ranges instead of individual temperatures, whatever makes sense for your data. 
As I said before, practice in a setting similar to the one you'll be in when the curtain goes up on your presentation can be a big help. Although you may only spend a few seconds per slide fumbling with the laptop or the remote, or walking to and from the podium, these lost moments add up, especially during a 10 to 15 minute talk. If your presentation is running long, don't plan to just talk faster. Although it's true that many people tend to talk a little faster than normal when they're in front of an audience and are maybe a little nervous, don't rely on this. If you see the moderator flash the warning sign and you've got a bunch of slides left to go, don't just talk faster. Take a moment to think about the rest of your slides and skip the ones that you can so that you can focus on the most important ones. Along these lines, it can help to assign mental mileposts to certain slides to help you gauge how slowly or quickly you're moving through the material. Let's say that when you're practicing, you discover that you're normally finishing your last method slide at the halfway point. When you're giving the presentation, if you're getting to that point in the first few minutes, that's a good signal that you need to slow down. Likewise, if you've used up more than half of your allotted time, it's time to pick up the pace and consider skipping a slide or two in order to complete the talk in the time allowed. Again, proper planning and practice will help you avoid these problems altogether, but if things start to go off the rails a bit, these tips can help you get your presentation back on track. In this presentation, we've covered the basics of planning a presentation, preparing slides, and delivering a talk with confidence. To tie it all together, it's useful to discuss the following questions as a group, or if you're watching this presentation by yourself, at least consider them and maybe write down a few notes. What are the most important elements of an effective presentation? We've talked about presentations as a story or a conversation that you have with the audience and the importance of using but not relying on slides as visual aids to help you carry on that conversation. We've also talked about the importance of presenting your data clearly and correctly and how certain types of figures and slide designs can help you do that. We've also talked about giving the presentation and delivering your message with the words you say and the subconscious messages you send with your slides and body language. What do you think are the most important elements? If you were to distill this presentation down to a top 10 list of guidelines, what would they be? Finally, how might these guidelines vary for presentations to different audiences? Do the guidelines change depending on the context, or do you follow the same basic guidelines for clarity and effective communication in each scenario, but go about achieving that in slightly different ways for a conference presentation, lecture, job talk, etc.? In listening to this presentation and working through these discussion points, Hopefully you've gained some new tips and tricks and can apply these PowerPointers in your next presentation. Thanks for listening and good luck.